For us, the really important part here is to make it something that anyone can do. We want to build an iconic company that changes how we create content. In 10, 15 years, I want it to be as easy for people to make video content as it is to write something today. Herzlich willkommen bei Digital Optimisten. Ich bin Alex und in diesem Podcast geht es um Inspiration für neue Geschäftsideen und Strategien, wie man diese umsetzen kann. Ich möchte eine ikonische Firma bauen. Wir bewaffnen die Rebellen im Kampf gegen das Imperium. Ich will, dass, aus jeder, dass jeder aus seinem Schlafzimmer heraus Hollywood-artige Filme entwickeln kann. Das sind Sätze, die du in diesem Interview hören wirst von einem beeindruckenden Gründer, Victor Ripabelli von Synthesia. Ich kann dir sagen, ich bin echter Fan seines Produkts. Ich würde sogar so weit gehen, dass es ein magischer Moment war, als ich sein Produkt das erste Mal ausprobiert habe. Ich habe Folgendes gemacht. Ich habe einen kleinen Text geschrieben, ich habe einen künstlichen Avatar ausgewählt und ich habe die Sprache ausgewählt. Das war's. Und dann hat, hatte ich einen fotorealistischen Menschen, der meinen Text genauso vorgelesen hat, wie ich das eingegeben habe. Wie eine Nachricht, du kannst dir vorstellen, wie eine Art Nachrichtensprecher, dem du Worte in den Mund legen kannst. Jetzt ist Audio nicht das perfekte Medium dafür, um dir ein wirkliches Bild zu geben, wie diese Deepfakes äh, funktionieren, wie magisch diese Deepfakes sein können. Aber ich glaube, wir sind jetzt schon zu 96 Prozent da. Also wenn man diesen, ich nenne es mal Nachrichtensprecher, diesen Avatar, dann sieht, man merkt es noch hier und da ab und zu, dass es kein echter Mensch ist, aber es ist verdammt nah dran. Synthesia ist Text-to-Video und das beschreibt es eigentlich wunderbar. Du gibst einen Text ein und schon erzeugst du ein fertiges Video, das du dann verwenden kannst. Synthesia ist unter anderem von Mark Cuban, dem Besitzer der Dallas Mavericks und Google Ventures finanziert und setzt in diesem Jahr 2022 sein hyperaggressives Wachstum fort. Ein super spannendes Interview. Es kann sein, dass Viktor wirklich ein Elon Musk von morgen ist. Ich würde das nicht ausschließen nach diesem Gespräch. Ich war auf jeden Fall wirklich begeistert. Bevor es losgeht mit dem Interview, noch ein kleiner Hinweis. Auf digitaleoptimisten.de kannst du dich zum kostenlosen Newsletter anmelden, in dem ich unter anderem meine Geschäftsideen aufschreibe, die unbedingt mal jemand machen muss, mir aber leider die Zeit dafür fehlt. Am Ende der Folge teile ich wie immer meine drei Learnings aus diesem Gespräch. Zu viel der Vorrede, auf geht's zum spannenden Gespräch mit Victor Ripperbelli, Vorreiter im The zum Thema Deepfakes und Gründer von Synthesia. Victor, welcome to Digital Optimisten. Where does this podcast find you? <laughs> Thank you so much, Alex. Glad to be here. I am currently in London in the Synthesia HQ. Nice. You guys are pretty much remote, right? But you, uh, you hold yeah. on the fort. Yeah, I, I, I guess like most other tech companies, um, we have a remote model. So we, we kind of started the company in London the first couple of years. But when COVID hit, uh, we just went full remote. So now we have, I think, four or five kind of hubs in Europe. And then we have an office in New York. And then we have a bunch of people who are sitting basically all around the world. Um, and it's working fantastically well. So I'm really glad we switched to that model. Oh, we might have to talk about that too, because I know that a bunch of startups are trying to figure it out. But uh, let's take things uh, one step at a time. I have to tell you, Victor, I am thrilled to have you on because I believe your product is the closest thing to magic that I have seen in quite a while. <laughs> I'll go on record saying that. But uh, before we talk about Synthesia, which is the name, that's the name of your startup or scale up, however you want to call it, let's get to know you a little bit. Before Synthesia, you worked in and founded several agencies and consultancies, mostly focusing on growth strategies and SEO. And in 2016, you found a consultancy that was focused on VR, AR, machine vision and machine learning. What tickled your interest in the topic of virtual reality, augmented reality, machine vision? Yeah, so the kind of quick download on, on my history, I guess, is um, I think it probably kind of starts, you know, in my, in my childhood, always been extremely fascinated by computers, started off as the, the family IT support um, and, you know, assembled my own computers, 
you know, played around a lot with them, played a ton of games um, in the, what's, what some people today would call the metaverse, lived inside World of Warcraft for a couple of years. Oh, you did? <laughs> um, and I think this like interest in computers kind of started to, uh, to, to become a little bit more kind of professional in my sort of late teens, where I basically started a few of my own websites. I started helping local e-commerce, uh, local uh, stores in, in, in the town in Denmark, in Copenhagen, where I'm from set up the e-commerce stores and I kind of slowly got into working online, right? And I really like this. Um, I'm kind of semi-technical, like I can code a little bit, but I'm a pretty bad developer. But I've always been really good at just like making things work. Um, so I spent a few years doing kind of my own thing. I had uh, had a little site where we post like uh, viral stories. This is in the early days of Facebook, back when you could you could post some some fun cat pictures or something like that that go viral. You could you could make a little bit of ad money. Mm-hmm. And I was building a lot of these like web stores. Um, I did that for some years, really loved it. Went to work in a big Danish media company. Uh, didn't really love that at all. Uh, I, I, I think I felt like I came in as a very young person and there was just so much bureaucracy. Uh, mm-hmm. But definitely learned a lot about how corporate structures work. And from then I, I went to work at the Danish startup ecosystem, um, particularly in a company called Founders, which is a venture studio. Mm-hmm. So it's sort of set up like a venture capital fund, but instead of investing in other companies, they actually started companies themselves. And I was employee, I think, number five. And Stefan, who's today my co-founder in Tunisia, was employee number four, I think. And um, basically, we worked together on a couple of projects there, some companies where we would, they would, the founders would kind of like start the companies um, and uh, we would kind of help grow them, try to find product market fit, and then sort of move on to the next thing. And that was really kind of definitely a very formative, formative experience for me. Um, it was a lot of like more traditional SaaS, I'd say, fintech. Uh, one of the big companies that came out of this is a company called Plio, which is a unicorn today, one of the biggest tech successes of, of Denmark. Um, and I, I did that for three or four years. Um, and once I did that, I really knew that I loved creating things and I definitely knew that I wanted to start my own company. But I also had this kind of bit of a lacking feeling that um, making accounting systems wasn't something I was super passionate about. I've always been a huge sci-fi fan. Mm-hmm. Um, and I kind of wanted to explore that side a bit. And especially once I got back from finalizing my studies uh, at Stanford, did a semester there, I came back to Denmark and I was like, I need to do something with deep tech. This is right around where VIAR had this inflection point where especially deep learning made computer vision stuff actually work. Mm. So to make a long story short, I decided to move to London um, to kind of figure out what I wanted to start. And that kind of started off with this consultancy, working with VR and AR, which was an amazing year where I got to work with lots of different people and lots of different projects and just get a really good kind of thorough understanding of both the market for these types of technologies, um, but also very much the underlying technologies. Um, and during this period is where I meet uh, Professor Matthias Niesner, uh, who's my co-founder, Professor Luis Agapito, who's my co-founder, and our, John, our CTO, John Stark. Um, and basically, we have the eureka moment that AI is going to change how we create content, and we want to build a company around that. Yeah, uh, let's dive into that moment. I'm quite interested in that. So now we're not talking about VR, AR. We're not talking about, well, we are talking about a machine learning in some uh, capacity. But um, we're talking about synthetic media and deep fakes. I guess those are the two uh, taglines that you know most people associate with uh, your company. Can you take me to that moment when you first un- uncovered or realized the potential of synthetic media and deep fakes, and and you know how to commercialize that? Uh, you, you mentioned you met a university professor. Uh, uh, how did you meet him? How did you guys? I mean, how did that happen? So. Doing doing all this work with VR and AR, um, I think that might not be obvious to people who are not deep into this space, but a lot of the underlying technology that makes VR and AR work is sort of the same technology that makes what you think of as synthetic media deepfakes work. So I was exposed to some of his work, and we had kind of a a, a connection to him. Um, And I saw his paper called Face to Face, which is, is the first kind of Definitely the first kind of really popularized paper on deepfakes. He went on to uh, the Jimmy Kimmel show and showcased it live. And it became kind of quite a big thing when he came out back in, I think it was 2017 or 2016. And after I spent a lot of time with VR and AR, I was extremely fascinated by these technologies and computer vision, which obviously sort of is, is the backbone of all this stuff, right? But from a market's perspective, I also did not feel like VR and AR was where it needed to be for it 
for me at least, to be interesting to start a company. I think mm-hmm. this was in the last hype cycle. I think we might be entering another hype cycle with VR and AR. Maybe this is the one that really takes off. But it was fairly obvious to me back then that there just wasn't the kind of market pull for these technologies, right? Even myself mm-hmm. back then, I had a VR headset and I love VR today, but I use it not even once a month, right? That and to me, that was just one of those signals. That, sorry, that yeah. was the time when Oculus Rift, for example, got acquired, I guess, right? And people, I know some people had those headsets. I always ask myself, this is fun, but what is the killer application on VR and AR? And I never could, the same with audio and voice, right? I could never really see the, the killer applications. Exactly. And that was also very much the feeling I had back then. It just wasn't as mature. The technologies wasn't good enough. The headset, the clunky. Now we have the Quest, right, which is completely wireless. And I think that's a huge step up. But I think the feeling was just back then that, you know, this is not something you can make a transformative company around at that time, at least. But what I got very interested in is if you took these underlying technologies and applied them to video, which is already a huge market, that's a different value proposition, right? Mm-hmm. So when I saw this paper for the first time, uh, this research that, that Matthias had done, I just saw that and it, it's basically kind of like the first deepfake-ish type of paper, uh, you could say, right? If you, if you Google it, you'll, you'll be able to see it. I just, I think a little bit like you said in the beginning, right? It was this magic moment of like, how can you even do this, right? Like, this is, this is absolute magic. Mm-hmm. And um, I just knew that this is going to be a change in how we, uh, how we make video content. And that was really interesting to me because the video market back then was huge. That's a very, very fast-growing market. And I think, you know, now, five years later, that has definitely turned out to be true. Video and audio seems like to be the default almost of, mm-hmm. uh, of, of everything we do online today, right? Um, I think to, to put that a little bit into context, uh, I've always been very interested in kind of like the history of, of media and I have a hobby as a music producer as well. And if you take other types of media, the kind of shift from when they went from being an analog medium to a digital medium has just been huge, right? You take something like music, the invention of drum machines, synthesizers, digital workstations on computers, they didn't just change how people could create music. They, they created entirely new genres, like techno on electronic music, for example, that didn't really exist until we could, we could synthesize audio and, and um, um, uh, audio and instruments, sounds in, uh, in general. And it created this entire generation of bedroom producers where it's less important that you, you know, lived in Hollywood and had a dad who worked in the record industry. With a MacBook, you have everything at your fingertips that you need to create an awesome song track, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and being someone who's very much into music, I think I always felt a lot of parallels to that, where something like video content is still very much constrained to, uh, you need a camera, you need to have actors, it's really expensive, it's really difficult. Like, you can't just go out and make a film if you have a good idea, right? So I think this democratization of, um, of media production is something that's very close to me. And I think if you zoom even more out, right, something like text, it's not that long ago that you couldn't type things on a keyboard. You literally had a piece of paper next to you. You'd write it out with a pen and paper. And if you wanted to copy that, you'd have a secretary or something like that copy those, those pieces of paper. Once we went to typing things on a keyboard, it's just a game changer, right? It, because all of a sudden you can do, you can have the internet, you can have a blog, you can edit text. It, it, it just fundamentally changes kind of like how the world works. And video and audio, is, is, as in speech audio, is one of those areas where this still really hasn't happened yet. We've had lots of innovation in how we work with video, but everything is still focused around the sensor, right? You're working with a, a sensor, a camera, or a microphone that records something from the real world. Then you can kind of take it onto your computer. You can edit it. But we can't generate it from scratch. They can do it in Hollywood, but it's um, extremely expensive, right? It's like creating, you know, 30 seconds uh, for a Batman film is hundreds of thousands of dollars. It takes 30, 40, 50 people to generate just one scene because it's a very kind of intricate, meticulous piece of work to do. So I think that that's kind of like, that's the eureka mode we all had, right? And that's the thing that that really motivates me and that I just find to be a incredible idea, right? It's this idea of let's just free creativity, enable people to create what they can imagine. And um, just like it has happened to photos with Photoshop, text with computers and keyboards and, um, and, and, and music with, with digital music production and, and, and synthesizers and drum machines and things like that. Mm-hmm. That, is, that is really interesting. I mean, I mean one thing that I want to underscore is the trend towards video. I mean, if you look at Facebook, maybe 10 years ago, basically everything was 
text, right? Then people started posting images and they realized, hey, you know, people click more on images. And now, I mean, with TikTok and, and everything that's happening, obviously the trend towards video is, is uh, no one is going to deny a trend towards video. And I, I, I like how you combine, you know, a, a general market trends towards video with the ability to be able to produce this kinds of this kind of content, right? You don't have to have a camera. You don't have to have you know some uh, visual graphic effects. But maybe what if just like techno can be created with a MacBook? What if you could be able to do it in your uh, in your bedroom instead of in a Hollywood great studio? And I think this ties quite well to uh, I think the grand vision uh, on of Synthesia that I read on your Twitter page because you wrote in a, in a tweet, we believe that in ten years anyone will be able to create a Hollywood grade movie in their browser using th- synthetic media. That's a big that's a big vision, right? Because you're saying you know you don't have to be 20th century Fox or Lucasfilm to create a great movie. You know everyone could do that, just like anyone could produce number one um, a music hit and you don't have to be in these big recording studios. But with that vision in mind, does that mean that in 10 years time, directors, actors, and all those folks working on a film will be a thing of the past? I think so. our vision really is to make video easy for anyone, right? And I think uh, the underscoring here is on anyone. Uh, I think today you can create lots of uh, of Hollywood great video if you have enough time and you work in the visual effects uh, programs that Hollywood is already using, right? Um, for us, the really important part here is to make it something that anyone can do, um, and I'm happy to talk more about kind of how we see that happening. Um, in terms of in terms of like if we replace actors and directors and things like that, I, I don't think so at all. I think it's going to be two different types of media formats, just like drum machines or synthesizers hasn't replaced guitars guitars and pianos. People enjoy those things for, for, for different types of music. And I think we'll see the same thing happening with this. When we say Hollywood great video, it's because it's easy to understand. I don't think that once these tools are out there, that people will be creating um, 90 minutes long films that look like something Hollywood. They'll probably look like something we don't really understand yet. And they'll probably be very weird to people who are not into this thing in the beginning. But I think it'll, it'll very much develop as its own media format. And I'm sure that's going to be very different from the 90 minutes movies we, we know from, uh, from Hollywood, right? I think the key thing for us, or for me really here, is to, is, to, is to enable anyone to create the best content and let the best content win, right? Today, it, it, this entire industry around like film, for example, it's, it's very much who do you know, how much money do you have access to, what have you done before? And it ca- kind of makes sense, right? Because it's really expensive to make a Hollywood film. So the, the people who are financing those films want to make sure that you, are, that you know how to make a good film, that you've proven yourself before. Um, but, but what you really want to get to is a world in which all of this stuff is just democratized and anyone who has a good idea can have a shot at it, right? And then we'll probably see like very, very large quantities of very, very bad mm-hmm. stuff that, that's never going to go anywhere, just like most videos on YouTube are probably never viewed more than once. And that's okay, because we'll, in, those, in that huge pile of, of not-so-good content, there'll definitely be some diamonds and some people who will be, will be discovered to be maybe the next Christopher Nolan making synthetic video content, right? But I definitely think that this is going to be... Um, it, it's, it's, it's a market expansion exercise, Will there be things like camera operators? Might there be less of those in 10, 15 years? Maybe. But just like there's less blacksmiths today after we switched from riding horses to driving cars. Mm -hmm. Like it will probably have some kind of impact on the labor market. But at its core of everything, it's still creativity. It's still about um, telling good stories, right? And uh, I think we're very far from computers being able to do that. Mm -hmm. Sounds like we're about to go into the golden age of content creators. Would you subscribe to that idea? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think we've seen just in the last like ten years. I think we've we've already seen how much this is happening, right? Mm-hmm. Kind of from on all dimensions, from the tool that creators have available to the distribution that they have available to the monetization methods they have available. There's just so much innovation in this space, and um, I, I personally think that that's something that's that's really amazing. Like I myself, for example. I, I think I spent maybe $40 or $50 subscribing to um, newsletters, mm-hmm. but I don't subscribe to any newspapers, right? Mm-hmm. Um, 
And I think that's amazing. I, I, I kind of, I love the creator economy. And it's also a lot of like what we're powering actually, right? Like we're enabling smaller companies uh, all around the world, or individuals all around the world to make video content at a fraction of the cost and time and complexity that you'd otherwise need. Right? And this is also something I think it's really about, I think Shopify has this tagline, which is like arming the rebels, which I think is, is a really cool tagline. It's about helping the little guy compete with the bigger guys, right? And one of the ways you can do that is to make it easier to create content. So I think the creator economy is, is, is an amazing thing, and I'm really excited to see where we're going to be in, in five, 10 years. Absolutely. I absolutely agree. And I think you know, if you look at all the things that are coming up, uh, and Thincedia is a part of that movement, I feel, um, even though you're focusing on a different target group at the moment, and we'll get to that in a second. But let me um, stay on the topic of you know, movie creators just for a second. Um, back in 2020, I published an episode of this podcast where I gave 10 predictions for life in 2030. So I was extremely stupid. I'm pretty sure these are not going to be true. And then when I listen to those predictions in 2030, I'm going to think I'm a moron. But one of those predictions was movies will be tailored to individual audiences as opposed to having one size fits all movies. So let me elaborate a little bit on that because today, you know, everyone sees the same movie, right? I watch the same Star Wars as you do. But maybe if in 10 years time, most blockbuster movies get streamed to a home device, wouldn't it be possible to customize movies to the individual viewer? For example, you know, a Star Wars movie, if I'm more into action, then maybe I get one more action scene, scene added onto the movie. And maybe you're more into comedy, maybe you get one more scene with R2-D2 and C-3PO. Uh, because I always wondered, you know, it, it's so stupid to take like a $100 million budget and just release it and, and you cross your fingers and hope for the best that people like it. Um, you know, is that something that you think about too, or am I out out there? Oh, absolutely. I think I think this is this is definitely going to happen, right? Um, I think films and movies is probably not going to be like the first area where this is going to be very commonplace. Um, but I think it all goes back to what we chatted about in the beginning, right? Which is this idea of moving video or audio, for that matter, from an analog medium to a digital medium. What we've seen so far is that. Once you are working with a fully digital medium, like text, for example, HTML, CSS, how you make websites, then you're not constrained to working with things you've recorded in the real world. And once you're not constrained, you can build all kinds of cool things that you can't do when you're, um, when you're kind of bound to work with uh, a video, for example, that you filmed and it's 13 seconds long and that's kind of what you have to work with. Um, if you take something like websites, right, which is a fully digital medium, the first websites, they look just like paper magazines, right? People kind of looked at a newspaper, they're like, how can we recreate this digitally? And that was the first websites that looked like that. Then people figured out, like, actually, when we have this, this is like a digital medium, we can do so much more. And obviously now, we on the internet, almost everything we do is personalized, from our social media feeds to when we go to an e-commerce store, everything, <coughs> everything is kind of tailored to our experience, right? But I think the, the key thing here to me is that the neighbor of all that is that you're working with a 100% native digital medium. That's, that's what video and audio isn't today, right? Like, you just can't do it today. So once we kind of solve for that, which is what Synthesia is solving for, we're turning video into a 100% digital medium, then you'll be able to do all different kinds of things with it. And it's something we talk a lot about internally because I think right now we're in this chapter of synthetic media where we're kind of making... Um, websites that look like, like like newspapers, right? If you go to a website today, you see what our customers are creating, what we're creating. It's like, by and, by and large, it's, it's, it's like videos that you start, you click play on, and they play for some amount of time, and you watch them like you'd watch any other video. And that makes a lot of sense. That has a huge value um, in the world today. But if we fast forward a few years, right, I think that's where we'll really start to explore what does synthetic media as a format look like? Because once we can do all these cool things, right, people will do it. I think that's that's one thing the internet has taught us, that when you give people tools, they'll figure out ways to to, to make them really valuable. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's also, there's lots of talks about synthetic content and, and you know, uh, should we label synthetic content, for example, is, is one of the big questions that people are talking about. And I think that in not that many years, like three, four, five years, I think it'll be very, very obvious when you're watching something that's synthetic because 
it's going to be personalized. It's going to be tailored to you. It's going to utilize the fact that this is a generated video, a generated piece of audio. Um, so it, it's going to be it's going to be very obvious that you're watching something that is that is um, synthetic, just like it's very obvious when you're looking at a website as opposed to looking at a, at a paper magazine. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think I think for movies and entertainment, I think it's one of those industries that generally moves slow because it's very it's big budgets. You have to take a it's it's a big risk to do something like this, and it's, it is actually a very conservative industry, um, which is something we learned early on when we started Synthesia, and we we kind of did the kind of first product which we sort of made was never meant to be the thing that that was going to be big, but we did some dubbing, and maybe you've seen that uh, David Beckham ad and things like that. We actually thought the entertainment industry would be extremely prone to innovation, doing things in new ways, but I think that uh, I think that what, what I'm trying to say here is that. These big companies and blockbuster films might do this eventually, but I think what you'll see way before that is these like hobbyists, mm. creators who get access to these platforms. They'll start to create these kind of interesting, personalized experiences. They'll make a million experiments, and most of them will be very bad, but some will figure out, actually, it's quite fun if your friend is in the movie when you're watching it, right? Mm. Or actually, it's quite fun if you get to three times during the movie, select what the main character should do or should say or something like that. I think it's like it's completely unexplored, like how this format really works, um, and I think that's something that's going to be really exciting to see what people are going to be doing and what's the kind of what's what kind of the final form of a personalized film look like. Right? I don't know what it's going to look like. Mm-hmm. I think there's lots of interesting ideas, but that's going to be something that I think uh, the kind of community will we'll will, uh, yeah, will we'll discover an and will answer by themselves. I think I, I think an interesting anecdote here is mm-hmm. you take something like streaming of web. Um, of uh, video and audio in the browser. So WebRTC was one of the technologies that really enabled this to be something that kind of anyone could do. And once the technology came out, right, a lot of people were like, oh, now everyone is going to, you know, create their own new studio. Or they're going to, basically, they're going to do things that we already know from, like, live TV. And uh, that, that was pretty interesting to kind of see, right? Nobody would have predicted that the $10 billion use case would be Twitch, where people watch other people play computer games, right? That's like completely non-obvious. And Twitch built a really awesome platform around live streaming. Uh, they figured out that like watching other people play computer games is fun. They built tools and features around that. And it's obviously like a huge thing today, live streaming. But it's in a, in, in a format in a way that no one would have predicted, right? And I think we'll, we'll probably see the same kind of thing play out with, um, with synthetic content and personalized entertainment experiences. Yeah, I think we see the same thing happening with the metaverse right now because, you know, people know, well, real estate is something uh, interesting. So, you know, I build stuff like the sandbox or, uh, you know, whatever they're called. And I just, I'm just Gucci and I buy, you know, a high street fashion uh, and I just build a boutique there and put my stuff in there. That's just an example of, you know, how we use new technology to replicate things that we already know but not using it in the way that it can be used for. And that's what uh, what you're saying is happening too with synthetic media. So let's uh, bring it back to Synthesia because we're, you're not there yet. You know where you build movies, but you still have a really interesting use case. And I'll let me sum it up and please um, uh, you kind of um, yeah, amend or, or correct me if I'm saying it wrong. So when I use your product, the only thing that I need to do is I need to do I need to make a couple of decisions. The first one is I just have to sort on a text. So I just you know type in a text uh, uh, and you know whatever saying uh, explaining something or giving an intro for my Instagram uh, uh, channel or whatever. And then I have to choose an avatar and I have to choose a language. And that's the only thing I do. And I can add even more stuff on it, like like a PowerPoint kind of experience in a way. And then uh, I say, hey, render this video. And then this avatar actually says what I typed it, what I typed in the box. So it's text to video. And the most interesting question that I had, is, uh, you know, and you kind of touched on it a little bit, was how did you guys settle on the target group of, of, of companies? Of, of, you know, you're, you're marketing it towards uh, on, in, a, in a B2B way. So for companies, uh, producing training videos or sales materials. How did you settle on on companies? That's that's a great question. Um, so when you build deep tech companies like Synthesia is right, like half the company is PhDs doing deep research into how we get to that 
Hollywood film in 10, 15 years, which just to underscore is really far away still, right? Like we're, we're not close to that at all. Um, I think when you build a company like this, the sequencing is incredibly important because you have an added dimension of how quickly can we develop all this AI stuff. And that's like, we're doing blue sky research. Like most of the things and problems we're, we're trying to solve at Synthesia has not been solved in academia before, right? So it's a bunch of really hard problems that you can't really time box. Like you can't say it's going to take six months to build this or three months to build that. A lot of these things are just fundamentally unknown, right? Um, so I think the sequencing part is, is, is really, really important here. Um, and when you build these technologies, I think Oculus and VR and AR is a good example of this. It's easy to get caught up in all the exciting stuff which we've just talked about, all the movies and entertainment and free and creativity and all this stuff. And I just see, I think we've seen so many times people kind of built for this immediately, but it's unclear if you can actually build it, and it's unclear if it's going to have value or if it's just going to be cool. So something we've always been very, very diligent about is almost being uh, like more boring. <laughs> that means be like really focusing on where can this actually provide value today, because we could easily have been doing focused on doing, doing entertainment or working with film studios, creating kind of fun ads or fun trailers, fun small experiences, things like that, right? But we want to build an iconic company that changes how we create content. So it's really important that we, that we build a business, right? Um, once we kind of crack the first version of Synthesia, which is this kind of text-to-video tool that we have today, where, as you said, it is really, really easy to use, you basically go through this exercise of figuring out, like, okay, now we have this piece of tech, who is it valuable for? And if you think of like the AI realism as like one dimension of what can the product do, that actually is one of those dimensions that to a large extent determines a lot of the use cases that's possible to do with it today, right? For example, if you're trying to do a Super Bowl ad, um, the technology is like clearly not there yet, right? If you go in and render a video, um, you, get, you have it done and you want to use it for like a TV ad. It's like not there yet. The videos are... Not 100% like a real video yet, and they still lack a lot of the emotion and gestures and things you'd find in a normal video. And also, a Super Bowl ad is you're probably going to be paying millions of dollars to put that on TV. So spending 50000 or much less than that on getting an actor in the studio and recording it like the best way possible makes sense, right? Um, and then in between the Super Bowl ad and like HR compliance videos, there's a bunch of stuff in between. Um, and... You know, we I basically what I went out and talked to three, four hundred people, I think, or something like that, with my co-founder Stefan, just to figure out what is the problem space, what is the mental model around video, and one of the things that we found, um, and it actually goes very much along in, in line with what we talked about before, of like this kind of a new medium, and this is a new way to utilize uh, this type of technology, is that this is not so much about it's not really about replacing video production, about replacing text, right? We, we live in a world now where, as we also spoke about earlier, most of, in our private lives at least, of the content we consume is video and audio. And we've gone all the way from blogs to Twitter, which is like entirely text, to Facebook and Instagram, which was entirely, mostly images, to now we have something like TikTok, where if you look at the TikTok interface, right, there's almost no text. Unless you decide to go to the comment section, there is no text on TikTok. It's quite fascinating if you look at, if you compare it to something like Instagram, which is the, the huge big hit before that, right? But there's still, you see images, there's see some text, you see images, see some text. TikTok is entirely video in, in the interface. Um, so we've kind of, as consumers, we're very used to watching video and audio all the time. Um, and most people spend way more time on that than they do reading books, for example. But in our corporate lives, we're still mostly exposed to text. It's long emails, it's PDFs, it's slide decks. Um, and it's just not a great way to communicate in 2022. So what we have kind of found there, right, is that being able to create video in a really easy manner, which is what you can do in Synthesia, enables um, companies to take their text assets and turn them into video. To give you a very real example, let's say you're a huge fast food chain, for example, and you have to train hundreds of thousands of people every year on how to empty a deep fryer and how to adhere to COVID guidelines, for example. Then no one in this organization doubts that having video content would be more effective as in people basically understand more of the content, they remember more of the content, and they are more productive, faster in their job, right? Um, what they used to do was they would have lots of text because that's kind of like the only thing you really can produce at scale. If you film things with a camera in a big corporation, right? It's, it's cameras, it's actors, 
it's post-production, it's um, getting it approved by everyone in the company. It's a very long process. It's very complex. It takes a lot of people. And once you've finalized your content, you probably have changed some parts of your policy. So now the video doesn't work anymore. Um, so they've never done video before. Everything has been like slide decks. So when you started off in this, this company, you would have to read, you know, 15 pages of PDF documents to understand all these things. And not, not a lot of people remember those. Instead, what they can do now is that the team who used to write those slide decks or write those PDFs, they can now just use Synthesia and they can create video content themselves as easy as if they were typing something out, right? So the company gets the benefit of training people with video, where there's a higher information retention and higher engagement rate, but without adding on all the costs, both in terms of dollars, but also very much in terms of time and complexity that you'd otherwise have with video production. And I think this really is like the crux of why Synthesia is growing so fast and what, what we're doing really well, right? It's, it's not about replacing video production. It's not really about creating um, Super Bowl ads or all those kind of exciting things yet. But there's just a huge bulk of content which exists that text today um, that really benefits from being turned into video, especially in, in big organizations. Gleich geht's weiter mit dem Gespräch mit Victor. Vorher möchte ich dir eine kleine Geschichte erzählen. Ich habe im Pandemiefrühling 2020 in den USA gearbeitet und habe mir zu dem Zeitpunkt gedacht, Mensch, das mit Covid, das ist alles ein bisschen spooky. Vielleicht sollten wir doch wieder zurück nach Deutschland ziehen. Aber eine Sache braucht man, wenn man umzieht, nämlich einen neuen Arbeitgeber. Ich habe mich ein bisschen informiert und bin relativ schnell zu dem Zeitpunkt auf Kununu gestoßen. Kununu hat 1,9 Millionen Einträge in ihrer Datenbank, in denen Arbeitnehmer ihre Arbeitgeber bewerten. Für mich damals und für dich heute kann das daher ein echt gutes Werkzeug sein, um hinter die Kulissen eines neuen Arbeitgebers zu schauen. Und wie wir alle wissen, so viele Menschen wie heute haben selten ihren Job wechseln wollen. Kununu will die Arbeit für alle besser machen. Geh auf kununu.de oder klicke auf den Link in den Show Notes für mehr. Und jetzt genug vom Sponsor, zurück in die Folge. That's an interesting perspective because it is indeed a paradigm shift, right? If you look at how to replace text versus, you know, how to replace video that is already there. I've seen also you you share a lot of stuff. I can only recommend to everyone listening uh, to follow you on Twitter because you actually post some really interesting stuff also about, you know, the growth of your company. And obviously, I saw there, there was a spike in video creation um, uh, last year. I, I guess it, it, it's probably moving the same pace in 2022. Where does your growth come from? Um, I, think, I think it's one of those magical experiences when you build a startup and you build something that, especially when we launched a product, just sort of barely worked. I think it's fair to say anyone who tried to tease you out in the first, like, six months of being live, it was a very, very basic product, right? Yet people just wanted more of it. Um, so I think there's just this natural pull in the market. People want to make more video. They're frustrated with working with cameras and microphones and all the kind of traditional way of doing it. They want an easier way. So even if you build a solution that, um, you know, still has a long way to go before it's on parity with, with like normal video, I think we've gone a very far away the last one and a half years building out the entire kind of video creation platform. Um, then you get this kind of a magical thing of people really wanting it and really wanting to tell the world how amazing it is. You also talked yourself a little bit about when you tried it the first time, you had that kind of magic moment to it. And that's a magic moment that people want to share with their friends and their families. Um, and that is obviously, that's also great for us as a company, right? Because we get, we get lots of exposure once the kind of viral loop gets going. Mm -hmm. So actually, it's like primarily word of mouth that we're growing with. Um, which is, I think, is probably every founder's dream, right? That people just talk so much about your product that they come to you and they buy from you. Um, of course, over the last two years since we launched, we've then you know, done a lot of work on really figuring out like, who, are the, who are the best customers for us, who can get the most value out of it, what use cases work really well, which use case doesn't work so well. Um, and that helps us kind of you know, guide people and, and really be more of kind of consultants to our customers and being salespeople. And I think that's that's really, really important um, because we don't have to go out and knock on people's door to try and sell our product. They come to us. Um, we can have a much more consultative approach. And I think that is just, that kind of changes the equation a little bit on how fast you can grow because every time you work with a customer, you learn something, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're not trying to push something down their throat just because you need to meet your quarterly goal. 
it becomes this kind of more collaborative thing and, and, and that's the relationship we have with most of our customers. And obviously, every time we make a learning, we, we can then apply that, right? So I think uh, I'm, I feel very fortunate that we have a product that, uh, that people really love. I also have an absolutely amazing team who's building it. That's not me, right? Um, it's, it's the entire team that, that we have here. Um, and I think it's, it is just one of those things, right, where if you solve a big enough problem, people will buy it. And they'll also be really interested in helping you develop the product. And, um, and I think that, that that's magic uh, in some sense when you're building a company. Mm-hmm. Got it. Uh, let me, but let me, let me maybe get this straight. So um, earlier you said, you know, we try to build the best technology that we can. And, you know, people will, it's like, you know, the saying in the US, uh, um, uh, build it and they will come, right? So maybe, uh, and people are coming. But also you are, you know, work focusing a bit stronger on the uh, the, com- the the corporate angle, right? Training videos, as you mentioned before. So um, assuming, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but assuming that you are currently focusing a bit more when you hire account executives, you know, on the, the corporate side, uh, what, I- what are the next kind of customer segments that you're looking at? Because you have so much room to market this product, right? You could go the influencer route, right? You could say, hey, you know what, you know, let's, uh, uh, you, would you like to, um, you know, produce better content on, uh, on TikTok, whatever. You could go, um, I mean, so many different routes, right? But, uh, and so maybe let me tie it back to when you think about your roadmap and all the features that you're building, are you still kind of, you still have a customer kind of in mind? Are you still really focused on this corporate customer or do you also look at features that might be of more relevance for uh, other customer groups, say influencers? We definitely see Synthesia as being a general platform, right? Where you can build many different types of content and we definitely also have a lot of people who create sales and marketing content, for example. An interesting anecdote there, I think, is that um, the quality threshold for someone who lives in the US or the UK is very different for someone who lives in Southeast Asia, for example, right? So when I say that, I don't think that all of our videos may be you know, good enough for like a Super Bowl ad. They're probably not good enough for like the equivalent of a Super Bowl ad in, in Malaysia, but they might be good enough for some other use case in Malaysia that, that wouldn't kind of transfer one-to-one to the US and, the, and, uh, and, and UK. And we have a very global customer base, right? So we're definitely seeing people creating other types of content and learning and development. I think for us, we'll definitely kind of open that up. And I, I think we're also, you know, we are building towards kind of a general purpose platform. But I also am a quite big believer in focusing, uh, especially when you are still kind of an early stage startup. But we're not an early stage startup, we're a scale up now, I guess. Uh, it's, it, last year was was pretty wild, but I believe a lot in focus. I believe a lot in in, in figuring out like one customer's pain point and then building towards that. And um, in the future, maybe we'll launch these other things. But I think something like influencer marketing. I mean, it's something we're kind of exploring. Like we have our own TikTok, um, which is, I mean, it has millions and millions of views, right? I think we've proven out quite well how you can create synthetic content for TikTok that people really love. So there's definitely kind of lots of opportunity in that space as well. But ultimately, you have to figure out what do you want to do really well instead of trying to do five things really well. And right now, that is definitely focusing on, on what we think of as like training, learning, uh, corporate type of use cases, right? Mm-hmm. We have this sort of mental model of, um, of uh, this being... We think more of Synthesia as PowerPoint than we think of it as Adobe Premiere, right? Mm. Um, and it's kind of all in our mission. Like our mission is to make it easy for anyone to make video, and that's what we're seeing, right? We're not seeing this as something that's being used by the video department. We're seeing this being used by everyone else in the company mm. who was never able to produce video content before. Got and it. I think so this motion. What you're saying is PowerPoint. Everyone can use PowerPoint versus just a small mm-hmm. set of specialists use Photoshop or Adobe Premiere or whatever. Exactly. I think it's it, it's again about this. It's less about replacing video. Or it's less about like empowering the video production team to produce more content. The really important thing for us here, right, is democratization of video production and enabling someone who's a learning instructor, someone who's a marketing manager, someone who used to produce content in text or slide format, they can now produce video content. Mm-hmm. I think this 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 uh, this piece of the of, of of kind of like the opportunity space is is what I'm most interested in right now. 
But that said, I think you could, there's so much opportunity in synthetic video and synthetic media right now, right? You could most likely build an amazing product for influencers as well. You could build an amazing product for sales and marketing as well. Um, but ultimately, I think as a, as, as, or at least that's our philosophy, let's focus on doing one thing really well. And then the other thing can, other stuff can come down the line. Focus, yes. I guess that's what the, the number one thing is from all these interviews that I have with uh, all these founders from all over the world is what they all say is, you know, let's not uh, use, lose focus. One other question that I believe is probably hard for you to answer, but I have to ask it because I read another tweet of yours uh, the other day where you, uh, I mean, it's a couple of days ago when you announced your Series B round. I think that was 50 million. So an impressive round that you guys raised. And NASDAQ actually had it on, I think, Times Square, right? They, they announced, uh, <laughs> they, they congratulated you for your Series B round. I'm not sure if that was a fake, <laughs> actually, but it no, was, that was, that was. That was real, that was real. That was real, okay, because you can't be sure with you uh, what's fake and what's not. So it said, uh, thanks to NASDAQ, and you said, thanks to NASDAQ for announcing our Series B on Times Square. We'll be back for the IPO soon. And you had a smiley face after, you know. So, um, I mean... <laughs> When you look at what's going to happen down the road with Synthesia, um, you know, are you guys aiming for an IPO? And I know it's very early days, right? So, uh, uh, but what's your end game with, with Synthesia? So, I think we want to build an iconic company that fundamentally changes how we how we make content, right? Uh, how if that's going to be expressed as an IPO, as we're going to stay private, I think it's it's. It's probably too early to, to think about that. Um, but that is certainly the ambition, right? I think if you if you look at a company like Adobe, for example, Adobe really has obviously built a huge and amazing company around what I think of as like editing, right? But taking content from a camera or from a microphone and using that in Premiere or After Effects, whatever you have it, and then an ex expert, a professional, can make some awesome content out of that, right? I think there's an opportunity to build, you know, the platform that enables you to generate content from scratch. So you're not working with cameras and microphones and anything like that. And and I think that's that's probably where we where we want to be in 10, 15 years, right? We want to build the platform that enables anyone to to really make content like this. Um actually, sorry, let me just redo that again. The other answer was better. Um okay, so yeah, so I think uh Our ambitions is to, to build an iconic company that changes the way we, we make content. Um, if that's going to be expressed as an IPO, or if we're going to stay private, it's probably too early to say. Uh, but we definitely have, we have huge ambitions. And the way I think about these ambitions is there's sort of one part of this, which is the, all the AI stuff we're doing. So you've seen the videos. Right now, we're focusing on digital humans. It's a long roadmap, just on getting those humans to emote better, use their hands, gesture, interact with objects. All the stuff we need until we can make that Hollywood film on a laptop, right? That's a huge part of the company with this new investment. We're investing significantly in not just what we want to build next year, but what we want to build in five years. We're building an entire kind of capture stage, building data sets. We're going to start publishing papers. All that, that, that whole part of the company is going to be something that's going to be much more visible to the outside world in, in the coming years. The other part of this is, is the product side of things, right? It's what is the new UX for working with video generation as opposed to video editing. Um, we've talked a little bit about this already, but this new format allows for new ways to create content, new ways to consume content, and being the kind of market leader in defining uh, and building products around this is the other goal that's, that's really, really important for us, right? And one way to think of this is that I think kind of a trap of building technology like this would be we just build Adobe Premiere with avatars, a Canva with avatars, for example. Um, that might have some value, but it's not going to be a paradigm shift. It's just going to be a video creation app like we already know it with some avatars in it as well, right? And that's, that's probably also cool and valuable, but that's not going to fundamentally change who creates content or how we create content. That's really what I want this to be, right? I want in 10, 15 years, I want it to be as easy for people to make video content as it is to write something today. And I think that's, that's, that's probably like the best metric for how successful are we is what is the percentage of content that we each create on a daily basis that is video. So if you go even just like 20 years back in time, right, most people didn't create like text every day. Like it was not, it was not normal that everyone was like writing stuff all day long. That is now normal. We all write emails, we write PDFs, we write slide decks. It's not like a 
it's not like a specialized job to write things, right? It still is, of course, to some extent. We all produce text content every single day. Um, and I want to move that to video. So I'd say in 10, 15 years, if we're really successful, then most of us in our professional lives and hopefully also in our private lives will be creating much, much more video than, than what we're doing today. Yeah. I mean, Victor, we've been spending um, the whole interview now on the prospects of synthetic media and how it can you know, actually have positive effects. Yet when I you know, look at the media coverage on deepfakes and synthetic media, it's overwhelmingly negative. And you know, um, obviously the threats of, of not knowing what the truth is uh, are being, uh, is being highlighted. Why do you think the me media and press is so negative on this topic? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> well, I, I think first and foremost, there is a lot of interesting ethical questions. There's certainly dangers with technology. It will be used by people with bad intentions as well. And we really need to make sure that we do everything we can to minimize that, right? Um, but I think this is just what the media has always done, right? Like, I think if you go, <laughs> go 10 years back in time, there was another panic. And 10 years before, there was another panic. Um, I've, I've read a lot and studied this like, quite intricately myself. Um, when I was a kid, for example, right, playing Counter-Strike would turn you into a school shooter. That was the big panic in the media back then. Um, and 10 years before that, you know, there was Mortal Kombat uh, was, was pu pulled in front of Senate uh, to talk about how they're... I mean, if you look at Mortal Kombat today, which is a 2D fighting game, for those who don't know, probably came out in like 1995 or something like that, inspired the young people to violence and things like that. When Napster, Kassar, the internet kind of came out, people thought that uh, musicians and artists would die starving on the street because no one would ever pay for video or music content anymore. That, of course, turned into Spotify. In the 40s, people were worried that radio novels were going to turn their kids into zombies. In the 80s and 90s, the TV that's going to turn kids into zombies, now social media. So I think there's this kind of constant undercurrent of new technologies are always met with very large amounts of skepticism from Uh, from, from the media. And as with anything, there's a kernel of truth in it, but it is by far probably this one of these kind of moral panic type of moments, right? Um, so I don't think it's very weird. And I think when we started the company, it was actually, I, I thought it was a, a <laughs> I thought it was a, a positive actually. Um, and I'll tell you why. Like there's, there's a guy called Peter Thiel who has one of his sayings is like, Uh, you want to build something that a good idea that looks like a bad idea. And when we started the company five years ago, everyone was like, who started a deepfake company? Why would we do this? This makes no sense. This is all bad, 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 right? And that means that while everyone was looking at the technology only through that prism, there was a lot of open space to trying to think of this from first principles, like what's actually going on here, right? And how can we build something that's awesome based off that. And I think what's really going on here, and I think that's, that's the thing that actually frustrates me the most about the kind of media coverage of all this stuff, and we've talked a lot about this in this podcast today, is that you have to look at this from first principles. What is happening is that video and audio is moving from being an analog medium to a digital medium, right? That has happened many times before over the last 30 years with other types of media, and there's lots of learnings and lessons we can take from there. But that's what's happening. And that's going to have a lot of, obviously, I think, positive um, effects and use cases. And it's going to have some negative use cases. Um, but I think people, it's not, it's not as clickbaity, right? And I think that's, that is really what, unfortunately, drives the media today. Um, there's not, nothing that drives clicks and interests like doomsday uh, sayings. And I think also in the case of deepfakes, it's a very kind of visual and visceral technology, right? You can show a demo where it's like, Look at this AI that's really scary and it's going to do all these bad things. It's very easy to understand. And probably also, I think like most journalists also, they come from the, from the perspective of being a journalist, right? Which is definitely one of the areas where I think deepfakes will certainly have an impact in the future, right? With, mm. with, with fake content, for example, having to be verified. So I don't think it's particularly odd. I think it's just history repeating itself. Um, I think it's really important to also think about these things, like the ethical questions around it, the security questions, because it will be a problem, 100%, right? Like, uh, you're betting against history if you think that bad guys are not going to use deep fakes and synthetic media um, to amplify what they're already doing. So uh, I think it's also just, just, yeah, just very important to, um, to also recognize that 
while it's not the full story maybe they're telling, mm-hmm. it's definitely a part of the story and, and it's one that's really important to kind of solve for. Yeah. How do you think about it and how do you start to address the ethical concerns? So I think there's like, uh, from a practical perspective, there is like roughly three ways, I think, of this. So there is um, the first one, which I think is by far the most important, which is education, right? You've been able to forge uh, images, emails, tweets, more or less anything that is in the video or piece of audio for the last 20, 30 years, and the world still stands. People now need to understand that this is also, to some extent, going to be possible with video and audio, right? And that's something that, as a society and as a, the world, we will have to, um, to, to, to learn kind of relatively quickly, right? Um, I think part of this education is, of course, like education as in like the traditional sense of having digital literacy uh, courses in school, for example. Um, Ukraine has actually been doing this recently and also been informing kind of like uh, their populace about deepfakes, for example. And we saw the Zelensky deepfake that came out like a few weeks ago, which was really bad, but was certainly like, uh, I think, an, an indicator of, of um, how this could be used in the future in a bad way, right? So I think digital literacy is extremely important. Um, and I think teaching this in schools and talking about it and journalists writing about it is really important. But I actually think that the most effective way of educating is by people being exposed to as much synthetic content as possible in the shortest amount of time, right? And um, I might be biased, of course, given that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm kind of building a platform that creates this. But once you get a message from Messi, say, asking if you want to watch a game with your friend next Saturday, you know that's not real. When you see David Beckham speaking nine different languages, you know that's not real. When you get a personalized onboarding video from HR and starting a company from an AI avatar, you know that's not real. You've tried to create a video like this yourself, you know it's not real, right? Um, and this is how we kind of build the muscle of people knowing not to just kind of outright trust everything that they see. So I think this is a really, really important uh, point. But then there's two other avenues of this, which are kind of technical solutions. So there's detection. So people are building essentially technologies like AI that can detect if a video is generated with AI. Um, I think this is like what a lot of people kind of instantly go to as the technical solution for this. It certainly will play a, a, a role, I think, in, in the overall toolbox of reducing harmful use of these technologies. But there's sort of two issues with it. One is that those technologies are not perfect, and you're basically playing like a cat and mouse game, right? Uh, you'll always be, um, you, you, you can't make sure that it'll work for, for everything. And if somebody wanted to do a really destructive deep fake, maybe they'll be working on it for one year and they'll put it out there on all the social media uh, platforms, and then they won't detect it as fake, and then it, it didn't really work so well, anyways. But I think the most important thing about it is actually that. And this is a deeper philosophical discussion, but what, co- what, what constitutes a piece of synthetic media, right? Um, depending on kind of how you, uh, how you think of synthetic media, you could say that more or less anything that comes out of Snapchat is synthetic media, right? Filters uh, that changes the shape of your face or changes your gender, or mm-hmm. dog ears on you, whatever, all that stuff is, is synthetic. Same thing with Instagram. When you edit a photo, things are kind of also synthetic. Um, Basically, I think in not so long, this detection algorithm would kind of be a little bit like having a detection algorithm that would tell you if a photo is photoshopped. It's a signal, right? But 90% of the of images on the, on, the, on the internet has been photoshopped to some extent. So it kind of loses a little bit of its value because it doesn't just point out like the bad things. So I think it'll, it'll, play, it'll definitely play like one role in the toolbox. I think the more interesting idea is about media provenance. I usually explain this as, imagine every time a piece of content is created, from you taking a photo of your, on your phone to the BBC publishing a news segment, for example, um, it's kind of watermarked or hashed, and it's saved in some um, online database. I kind of hate saying it, but this could be one where blockchain might actually be an interesting idea because it would be tamper-proof. And then you basically have a system that works a little bit like, I usually explain that Shazam, but for video content. Mm-hmm. So Shazam is an app for those who don't know, but you can you can open it on your phone, you can activate the microphone, it'll listen to uh, the environment, and if there's a song playing, it'll tell you what song that is. That technology is quite good today, and one of the reasons it's so good is because YouTube had to build this technology because they had people uploading, you know, amateurs uploading a video of themselves dancing to a Michael Jackson song, and Michael Jackson's right holders came and said, 
YouTube, you cannot host Michael Jackson songs without paying us something for it. So they build a system where they can detect music, they can put an ad in the video, um, and then everyone is happy, right? Mm -hmm. We need to build a similar system. So if you're watching, let's say that you are, you have your own YouTube channel, you take a segment of the BBC news in there, and maybe you only cut out 25 seconds, and that makes the clip sound, like the, the person who's being interviewed sound like they're saying something they don't, for example. You could put that in your video, then YouTube would detect this is a clip from this original video, click here to watch that video, mm -hmm. right? And the same thing, if you're watching something, it could say this clip here is 98% the same as this other clip that was uploaded by the BBC. This might be fake. But what this would allow you to do is you basically have kind of a verified system for all media content on the internet. So just like when you're on Elon Musk's Twitter profile or some other celebrity, they have a, a verified Twitter checkmark, right? Mm -hmm. You could imagine this have but for every single piece of content on the internet where you can verify where did it come from and who uploaded it originally. This, this system is interesting to me because it doesn't just solve for kind of like the deep fake use case, which today is a very small percentage of the overall disinformation problem, but it also solves for those things, which is what we're seeing now in Ukraine, for example, right, where people take a video from the war in Syria and they say that this happened in Ukraine yesterday. Those things are really difficult, right? Because... It's a, it's still a real image. It's just miscontextualized. And I think if we have this media provenance system, we could always go back and trace where did the piece of content originally came from, and are you watching the original version of this image or video? And um, that will be one of those things that can kind of put trust back in the system. And as an end user, you will be able to verify where this piece of content came from. Mm -hmm. All this stuff is really difficult to do technically. It's it's very far from being a solved problem, but um, I think this is going to be the end game. Uh, we're involved in the Adobe Content Authenticity Initiative, which is working on building this this, this kind of solution. And I have uh, I have very high hopes for for where that'll be in, in in three to five years. I I personally believe that the whole topic of synthetic media is going to spur a new universe of companies and business opportunities. And I think the three areas that you mentioned now, uh, education detection and watermarking or, you know, referring, I think there's also going to be champions that are going to emerge just uh, out for each of probably each of these three. Um, so that's a good, good take uh, to hear from you. Victor, we've sure. been talking for an hour already, and I can't leave you without asking uh, two questions uh, in kind of a rapid fire format that I ask uh, uh, every, each and every one of my uh, guests here on the show. The first one is, what is the book our listeners need to read? <laughs> you mentioned you're a science fiction fan, so you might go the Star Wars, Star Trek, Dune, I don't know. What, what's, your, what, what's your poison? <laughs> of those, I'd definitely say Dune. I'm a huge Dune fan. Um, I would say if I were to pick kind of one book that uh, is maybe not obvious or maybe not as well known that really changed my perspective that still sits in me after six or seven years, it would be Free Will by mm -hmm. Sam Harris, a neuroscientist. Absolutely amazing book. It's around 100 pages. And he talks, as the title implies, about free will um, and how his, his thesis is that it is an illusion that we have free will. Um, I won't go into the details of his arguments here, but it is a tremendously fascinating book is explained in a really, really um, easy to understand manner. And I think it's it's one of the books that has probably impacted my thinking the most. So if I had to pick one, it'd be Free Will by Sam Harris. Cool. That was a good pitch. I guess I have to read it now. I mean, that's, that almost ties <laughs> into, when you explained it, I almost thought, you know, it, it goes into this whole, sim we, we live in a simulation kind of argument, but I'm not sure if he's taking that route. Well, I think, I mean, it's from a philosophical perspective, I think there is a lot of that, right? Like how much are we actually in control versus how much are we just watching a movie in front of our eyes? Um, it's, 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 a very, it's a very deep topic, right? But I think he, he does a good job of, of covering not just why is it an interesting question and framing that really well, but also how does it actually impact the world, right? Like, for example, we're most around the world, like, most of our court systems are built around the idea that you have free will, right? Mm. Um, and that um, it, it kind of is something that, that, that cascades into all of society, the idea that we have free will. And uh, I think it just makes a really compelling argument for why it's worth revisiting how much free will we, we actually have. 
Mm. I think I have to read it. That was good. And thank you for not recommending the Lean Startup <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> 80% of people think of that first. You know what? I actually hate the Lean Startup. Um, <laughs> not because it's a bad book. It has lots of good lessons in it. Mm-hmm. But I think the worst thing you do as an entrepreneur is being kind of data-driven. Like, I think it's just in the early stages of a company, it just doesn't work. Like, you have to train your gut feeling, train, train your intuition. It's all you have. When you're at like huge scale, like maybe where we are at today, we can start to apply some of those like very data driven mechanisms. But I think it's, um, I think it's a very bad, I think it's a trap for a lot of founders to try and build a company with the lean startup method. But uh, that's maybe a topic for another day. That is indeed <laughs> a topic for another day, <laughs> Victor. That's an interesting take. The second question I'd love to ask you is what is the best advice you ever received? Uh, that's a good question. Um, it's one of those questions I think it's, that if you think about it in the shower later tonight, you're going to think, uh, oh, I should have given that answer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Exactly. I think the best advice we've received is, um, is a model of idea that I've that I have put towards me by both my mentors and even people don't know on Twitter and just the internet and books. But it's really this idea that if you just work hard enough, you can you can literally like force things into existence. Um, I had no qualification for starting Synthesia. I didn't have a PhD. I wasn't a great developer. Uh, I was doing growth marketing and I was like technical enough to understand these things. But, you know, from a CV perspective, I definitely didn't, I don't think I, I didn't stand out as, as someone who, who should start this company, right? And um, we got turned down by probably every single VC fund and every single angel investor in Europe. Um, I think 83, to be exact, I think was, uh, we, we actually made a spreadsheet of that once. Until Mark Cuban kind of put the first million into us. And obviously now things have been going really well. But I think it's really just it's like, don't be afraid to try. Um, if you don't try, it definitely won't happen. If you try hard enough, Things can just you can you can roll things into existence, right? And I think especially if you're doing something that's like really hard, like what we're doing, it's it's of course hard and it's a crazy vision and it's gonna be really difficult to get there. But what I have found consistently is that because we're working on something that's really hard and really interesting, people are much more willing to help you, both with uh, with introductions or capital or advice, than if we're building something that would be a much easier business, right? Like if you're building like a a marketing agency, for example, there's a lot less doors that'll just kind of open. If you come to people with a really crazy vision, people will just be like, wait, this is crazy enough that like I want to understand it and I want to kind of help you do this in some mm-hmm. way. And I think that's maybe counterintuitive to some people. Um, I think Sam Altman puts this as, in some ways, building a hard company is easier than building an easy company. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel like that's definitely something we've, we've experienced in, in our journey. That's some great insight. Victor, I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation with you. A fascinating topic. I will continue to, you know, really be um, uh, hooked to, uh, you know, the topic of synthetic media. And I will be following you guys as well, because I think you have a lot of room to grow. It's a fascinating proposition that you have. So thank you for being so candid with us today, sharing your ideas and thoughts. And um, I wish you all the best, all the success with Synthesia. Thank you so much, Alex. And thanks for, for having me. It was fun. Hier ist wieder Alex und das sind meine drei Learnings aus dem Gespräch mit Victor. Erstens, die besten Ideen sind die, die den Kuchen größer machen, nicht eine Lösung durch eine andere ersetzen. Synthesia denkt sich, dass es viel sinnvoller ist, die Millionen Menschen, die bisher kein Video produzieren können, zu Videoproduzenten zu machen. Der Markt ist damit also viel, viel größer, als wenn sie nur auf Leute gehen würden, die jetzt schon Videos produzieren. Victor sagt, wir wollen das PowerPoint werden, nicht das Adobe Premiere Paket. Das passt perfekt, denn jeder benutzt PowerPoint oder eine Form davon, aber nur wenige benutzen Adobe Photoshop oder die anderen Adobe Produkte. Also wie kann man einen, einen speziellen, einen, einen hochqualifizierten Use Case für alle erschließbar machen? Das ist es, was diese Idee so besonders macht. Zweitens, Content ist King und Video ist King. Die letzten zehn Jahre waren schon enorm für Content Creator auf der ganzen Welt. Die meisten geben sich nicht mehr damit zufrieden, Werbung zu machen auf ihren YouTube-Kanälen oder Instagram-Kanälen, sondern bauen eigene Mini-Imperien auf. Mit Technologien wie Synthesia sinkt 
sinken die Barrieren immer weiter, tollen Content zu produzieren. Vielleicht gibt es diesen Podcast in ein paar Jahren auch als Video, einfach weil ich diesen Text in ein Eingabefeld auf Synthesia eingetippt habe. Drittens. Es ist gut, eine Idee zu machen, die jeder für eine schlechte Idee hält. Das ist natürlich ein kontroverses Statement. Sicher gilt das nicht für alle Ideen. Manche sind einfach schlecht. Aber Viktor beschreibt, wie ihn alle belächelt haben, als er eine Firma rund um Deepfakes aufbauen wollte. Alle haben ethische Fragen gehabt. Alle haben die Gefahren von Deepfakes vorangestellt. Er hatte aber eine große Vision und nach über 80 Absagen eine Zusage bekommen von jemand anderem als Mark Cuban, Eigentümer der Dallas Mavericks, der dann eine Million Dollar in Synthesia investiert hat. Ich frage mich jetzt natürlich, vielleicht du auch, was sind die schlechten Ideen von heute? Vielleicht NFTs, Metaverse, Augmented Reality, Audio, keine Ahnung, aber es gibt eine Menge schlechte Ideen, die heute schlecht sind, wo die nächsten, Geschäft, die nächsten Erfolgsgeschichten wie Synthesia geschrieben werden. Das war's für diese Woche. Wenn dir dieser Podcast gefällt, dann gib mir fünf Sterne auf Apple Podcasts oder Spotify und schick deinem klügsten Freund und deiner smartesten Freundin diese Folge. Auf digitaleoptimisten.de kannst du den Newsletter abonnieren, der dir noch mehr Trends der Zukunft näher bringt. Bis zum nächsten Mal und bleib gesund.